Hello friends, I'm Max and this video continues the story of the accomplished projects and bushcraft activities during the last summer vacation spent at my log cabin camp. In the previous episode, I've shown my on-site preparations which were necessary for beginning the main summer project of making a wooden water wheel and a water wheel powered mill. Concurrently, I fixed the cabin's door broken by an intruder, turned an old workbench into an improvised lathe, made a new wood mallet, as well as installed and tested a DIY clogger's knife. As soon as I got to my log cabin camp, I started with the preparation for the main project of the season, building the water wheel powered mill. I've learned it a long time ago that meticulous preparation before an important task is the key to success. Abraham Lincoln is often quoted for having said, if I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend six sharpening my axe. Building a creekside water wheel will require making special tools, jigs, and setting up a workspace. Knowing that, I made a clearing next to my cabin last summer. I've already started milling these logs small end into short boards for the water wheel project, which is an easy task. All you have to do is make five to six parallel longitudinal cuts and then saw them off with one perpendicular cut. The order is important here. If you first cut a log section and then try to make parallel cuts, you will need to secure it somehow, which is an unnecessary nuisance. Because I had a limited gas supply with me and needed to mill a lot of short segments, I started making partial cuts and then used a wedge to finish the job. The thicker log spot end will be used for making my new multifunctional workbench. This pine is one of many that were downed by a severe storm a few years back. As you might remember, I used the same pines to build my log cabin. By the way, if you watched my other video, Two Chainsaw Secrets Turning a Tree into Perfect Boards, you might remember me asking for chainsaw brand and model advice. Since then, I bought the two most recommended chainsaws to replace my troubled Brazilian-made Steel 260. Both new chainsaws performed flawlessly all summer. Thank you all for your feedback and advice provided under the video. It really helped. A safety reminder, please be extra careful while sawing falling trees as it is a lot more dangerous than sawing vertically standing trees. Okay, back to the workbench. I decided to debark and size up the workbench's body on the spot, so it is cleaner and lighter for transportation. This sap with fungus is not dangerous, it will all die when the log dries. The cleaned log is ready to be transported to the cabin camp. It is soaking wet and very heavy. As I tried to lift it, I realized I wouldn't be able to carry it by myself without using an A-frame block system that I used to skid large logs for my cabin construction. Using it for transporting this log would take a whole day because I am so far from the camp. So I decided to make my workbench shorter and to shape it as much as possible on the spot to get rid of extra weight. I lost this hammer around here a couple of years ago. I used my old friend for securing a marking rope. Now I can make a straight cut using a freehand swinging technique to rough shape the bench's top surface. I've shown this milling technique in detail in the mentioned above video, Two Chainsaw Secrets. I will provide a link to it below. Unfortunately, I had to eradicate this bark beetle larva from its home. In a survival situation, a few of these would be a decent protein-rich meal. I've decided against checking this thesis and use it as a bait to catch fish for lunch instead. After a short break, I flattened the bench's work surface with a scrap plane so I could accurately shape its sides. Speaking of high-quality northern pine lumber, this pine was downed by a severe storm over 10 years ago, but its oily hardwood and most of the sapwood 
are still in very good shape, not rotted or damaged by fungus. Before transporting the log, I cut two side surfaces at exactly 90 degrees to lighten it some more. The workbench's vertical surfaces are just as functional as its top. I'm planning to make a woodworking vise of my own design, as well as a couple of side supports that will be attached to the vertical surfaces, which is why a 90 degree angle was critical for the bench's geometry. Because I haven't finalized my vise's design yet, I decided to cut out a primitive wedge vise at the bottom surface. Remember, I'm building a topsy-turvy workbench after all. Three cuts will remove a couple more kilos of stock. Add two wedges to the cut out perpendicular slot and you have a simple vise. Ok, I removed as much weight from the work piece as it was possible on the spot. Now it is time to move it to the camp. Because the log is soaking wet, I wasn't able to hoist it on my shoulder. They say, roll the round objects and carry the flat ones. But when I got totally exhausted carrying the log through the rough Karelian terrain, I reserved to flipping it along the final stretch through my walnut alley. You can probably make out vertical stakes supporting small saplings of black, gray and heart-shaped walnut along the path to the cabin. One day it will be a walnut alley leading to the cabin. Ok, the workbench is finally home and it needs legs. Because it was conceived as a topsy-turvy workbench, there will be seven interchangeable detachable legs, three at the bottom and four on top. The easiest way to connect legs to a workbench is to drill large mortises. I drilled the mortises at an angle to increase the bench's stability using a 44mm 1.7 inches force drum bead. Note, it is important to drill a deep hole in stages to better clear shavings from the hole, otherwise a drill bit will get stuck in the log, it won't be easy to get it out then. Once the workbench's mortises are drilled, it is time to cut round tenons on its legs. I used aspen branches that I secured onto my old workbench to cut tenons. You can see the same primitive wedge vise here too. I could have used hand tools such as a draw knife or a chisel for the task, which is how I actually installed legs on my shaving horse last season. However, because I have a large water wheel project ahead of me this summer, I chose to use a tenon cutter drill attachment of the same diameter as my Forstner drill bit. The tenon cutter has two sharp blades and cuts aspen like butter. The advantage of this mechanized method is speed. It is way faster than any traditional method and I have no time to spare during this 30 day vacation stay. Once the workbench's legs were installed and sized up, I began correcting its geometry using a draw knife. The log's butt end is noticeably thicker than its small end and it is a lot easier to even them out now while the log is still wet. It is important that any tool used is well made and I consider a workbench to be a tool. On the other hand, I probably just like to work with hand tools, especially if I made them. I like to watch how a hand planes iron makes shavings. I like the sound of the chisel breaking wood fibers as well as I love the smell of oily wood. I smoothed the chainsaw cut surfaces using my homemade giant chisel and a hand plane. And of course, the workbench has to look good, so I did some finishing touches. In the recent years, I've been making and using hand tools more and more. However, I haven't been able to fully give up electrical tools, as I always plan multiple projects for every summer while my off-work vacation time is limited. Right now, for example, I'm blacksmithing a couple of different types of traditional wood ogre bits. They remove stock surprisingly well. Stay tuned to see them in action at my log cabin camp. 
to prevent the bench's crosscut ends from drying faster than the rest of the log, I applied a special end grain sealer. It's the same wax mix you might have seen me using on my cabin spare proof door in the previous episode. I also sealed the cabin log's ends with it earlier. The wax sealer will equalize the bench's drying speed and prevent it from cracking. The three-legged configuration is admittedly less stable, but it doesn't rock on uneven surfaces. Because the mobile workbench is intended to be used on and off campground, its non-rocking three-legged configuration will come handy in the bush, as it is not easy to find flat surfaces here among rocky Karelian terrain. To make the four top legs, I can now use the very workbench they will be made for. As you can see, the tenon cutter now works slower on a denser wood. It is producing more uniform, long shavings and leaves a smoother surface on the tenon. Once I installed all four maple legs and flipped the workbench, I drilled two rows of dog holes that will accept the bench dogs and hold down clamps. I made the holes larger than usual but, as you will soon see, such inch and a half 40mm dog holes will have certain advantages. It is important to do a thorough layout job. The dog holes have to be drilled at equal distances from each other. The dog holes rows have to be in a precise array. Also, the holes have to be drilled at 90 degrees to the bench top, which is not easy to do without a drill press or some sort of a drill guide. To save time, I decided to do it free-handed, using a triangle as a guide. I'll be honest, I wish I spared some time for making a drill guide. The outcome could have been better. Some holes angles deviated from the vertical axis by a couple of degrees. The exit holes had large tear-outs. To clean their edges, I used my homemade carving gouge. At any rate, my workbench is almost completed and now it can be used for making the water wheel components. For example, I used it to finish making the water wheel's octagonal shaft. As a support, I used two wooden badge dogs that were made just like the legs, only shorter. I will also demonstrate a few different methods of workpiece fixation. In addition to using regular bench dogs, you can see a low-profile pack made from a branch. When you need to make a large number of identical workpieces that will all have to be precisely assembled into one complex structure, preferably with no gaps, spending time on creating an ergonomically organized workplace becomes a rational task. I found that the best way to secure a workpiece is to support it from three sides at once. Making this simple support from a bench dog, a nailed plank and a temperate peg significantly sped up the water wheel project. I will demonstrate my DIY supporter's strength. Using this secured workpiece's edge, you can lift the workbench. Okay. The method of securing workpieces horizontally is working well, but what if you need to secure a workpiece in a vertical position? I could have installed a woodworking vise, but I decided to save time and drilled a row of 44mm dog holes for my DIY bench dogs made using the tenon cutter, as well as 32mm holes for improvised hold down clamps made from branches. It is convenient to use both supports at once. Note how quickly you can secure and then release a workpiece. All it takes is only one or two light taps with a mallet and you're done. I used both a scrap plane and a smoother plane to quickly remove stock and then even out the workpieces end grain and side surfaces. Next summer, I'm planning to make a primitive pole lathe using this workbench as its base. A pole lathe uses a long stick as a return spring for a treadle mechanism that is powered by food. Turning is only carried out on the downstroke of the treadle. 
Meanwhile, I continued working on my water wheel project. It is convenient to lay out multiple work pieces on the workbench and then cut them to size right there. The improvised hold down clamps work equally well on the workbench's vertical and horizontal surfaces. It is important to cut out work pieces exactly along the layout line so that they would assemble into a seamless water wheel. As you can see, I was trying to lay out only the hardwood portions of my work pieces. A water wheel made from a pine's hardwood will last at least five times longer compared to one built from a pine's sapwood. Not only do the dog holes give more clamping options, but they also help the workbench dry more evenly, preventing it from warping and cracking. Now I flipped the workbench back upside down and secured the water wheel's shaft on it. I'm using three sides of the workbench for holding the shaft in place. I'm not a native English speaker, thus I'm not sure if topsy-turvy workbench is an appropriate name for my unusual contraption. I would appreciate any original suggestions on how to name this creation. The workbench is still fairly wet and heavy. The weight makes it steadier. Once it dries, it will get lighter. I have many ideas on how to add various attachments and accessories to the workbench to make it heavier. However, even in this incomplete iteration, the workbench was very useful. You probably know how difficult it is to secure an object of a regular shape to a bench top, such as this wooden trough. It is not easy to do it, especially when you apply force on the workpiece in different directions, like I was doing with the carving gouge. You can see that the trough didn't move at all in the process, while being secured to the workbench by four makeshift hold-down clamps. Check this out. Even if you pull the trough with a lot of force, the workbench will go with it. All this clamping force is provided by the dog holes and a couple of hold-down clamps made from branches. The hold-down clamps can be installed in seconds. I'm planning to make two additional metal hold-down clamps for my new workbench. Even though I spent valuable vacation days on making this workbench, I never regretted it. I used the workbench to make most of the components for my water wheel, I made a handle for my two-handed carving gouge, made a wooden trough and scoop, as well as I used it for sharpening my tools. In the recent years, I gained a lot of experience and video material on sharpening tools. I'm thinking about making a dedicated video on sharpening. As you could see, I produced a lot of sawdust and wood shavings using my topsy-turvy workbench. It endured a lot of sewing, hand planing and drilling this summer. This primitive tool rack was also made using the workbench. Not only does the tool rack fit the style of my workshop under the open sky, but it also organized my tools well. This video has gotten to be long, but I couldn't make it shorter. Otherwise, the workbench's topic wouldn't be fully explored to the extent it deserves. This was part 2 of my 30-day summer vacation, but I'm already editing part 3 and 4 about my water wheel powered mill, organizing a workshop under the open sky and various bushcraft culinary experiments. P.S. After reading many emotional comments under the previous video where I featured my bear-proof door broken by an intruder, I wanted to add that I don't hold it against him. I have my own version of why the intruder couldn't refrain from breaking the unlocked cabin's door with a crowbar. I think the intruder attained a tender emotional enlightenment while contemplating the touching defenselessness of a handmade structure. He just couldn't help his curious urge of an explorer 
and in order to enhance this gamut of feelings, he prodded the unlocked door with a crowbar. I remember, in preschool age, I experienced the same feeling while disassembling my dad's typewriter. Thus, I cannot judge the stranger for retaining his childlike spontaneity. This is Maxi Gorov from St. Petersburg, Russia. If you liked this video, perhaps you could share it with your friends. Let good people watch good videos. P.S. I only produce one or two videos max a month and if you don't want to miss new content like this, subscribe and click the notification bell to stay up to date with all of the latest content. Due to new YouTube's recommendation algorithm, its notifications have become more unstable otherwise. P.P.S. Below I left a link to my DIY projects playlist as well as playlists about my log cabin building, bushcraft projects, kayaks making and outdoor cooking. I hope to see you back on Advoco Makes.